All right, we'll begin our devotion, or uh, begin our study of the book of Zephaniah with prayer. Heavenly Father, you have promised that you, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, a day which we should be prepared for, a day we should be alert and watching for with humble and repentant faith. Lead us to be ready for the return of your Son at any day or any hour through faith. Through your word, keep us alert and watchful for his return and use us as your witnesses to carry your message out into the world, just as Zephaniah did, both warning of sin, calling to repentance, and comforting with your gospel message. Be with, comfort, and lead your people for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, so I hope everybody got a chance to take a look at the handout uh, we sent out last night. Um, taking a look at the book of Zephaniah. Uh, again, chapter 3 has some uh, great takeaways. Um, the name Zephaniah means he whom the Lord hides or shelters. And it's been interesting as we've gone through uh, these minor prophets, how many times the name of the prophet fits the message God gave him. So as we hear about the threat of the day of the Lord, we're also going to hear the Lord is going to hide and protect his people, um, which is what the name Zephaniah means, he whom the Lord hides or shelters. In chapter 1, verse 1, it makes mention of Zephaniah's lineage and goes all the way back to Hezekiah. Um, and we believe that Hezekiah to be... Um, the same Hezekiah who was the king, uh, Hezekiah. So as we hear Zephaniah, the great, great grandson of Hezekiah was serving in the days of King Josiah. Uh, Josiah would have been the grandson of Hezekiah and Ze Zephaniah, the great, great grandson of Hezekiah. Hopefully that made sense. That was a lot of genealogy. Um, time of writing, we're going to put it at about 625 BC. We're not exactly sure of the date. You can read commentators uh, who say, well, we know it was during the reign of Josiah, and we know it was before the destruction of Nineveh. That was it. Nineveh was destroyed in 612. So we know it's somewhere between 639 when Josiah became king and 612 when Nineveh was destroyed. Uh, Paul Kretzman puts Zephaniah at about 625 BC. I think that's as good a number as any. Uh, the audience, so who is he writing to? We're going to put that with Judah, Jerusalem, and God's faithful people. His purpose, again, we're hearing this drumbeat of the Lord's warnings on Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to hear that again with Zephaniah. But we're also going to hear some pretty strong words of comfort to the faithful people of God. Uh, a quote from Luther, taken from the Lutheran Study Bible. Uh, he prophesies the kingdoms of Christ in order to give the people abundant comfort so that they would not despair of God because of their disastrous captivity in Babylon, as if God had cast them off forever. But rather be sure that after this punishment, they would receive grace again and get the promised Savior Christ with his glorious kingdom. Okay, so that's a little bit of the introduction. Any questions before we dig into some of the themes that come up in Zephaniah? All right, as we look at Zephaniah, we have some similar themes um, that are presented in other minor prophets. We have this repetition of the day of the Lord something that Joel uh, spoke of. Um, that day of the Lord is the day of the Lord's visitation. That can be a fearful thing if it's a judgment, or it can be a joyous thing um, if it means deliverance. Anyway, the day of the Lord means the Lord is going to come and he's going to do something. Uh, the context will determine whether it's something to rejoice over or something to be afraid of. Uh, the ultimate day of the Lord, 
we know from the New Testament is the return of Christ. Um, 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Uh, also, Paul and Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians speak of Jesus' re return as the day of the Lord. Another theme we hear repeated is reference to the remnant or those that remain. Uh, we heard that in Amos and also in Micah. As we hear this all repeated, uh, it's a good reminder that the author of scripture is the same. Uh, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Uh, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit uh, that spoke through Amos and Micah speaks through uh, Zephaniah as well. Uh, Zephaniah is a great little book in three short chapters. He captures many of the themes that run through contemporaries like Jeremiah and Habakkuk. Uh, that second to last paragraph there, a quote from um, Martin Bucer, uh, a Lutheran theologian at the time of the Reformation. He comments, if anyone wishes all the secret oracles of the prophets uh, to be given in a brief compendium, let him read through this brief Zephaniah. So Bucer sees in Zephaniah some of a great summary of so many of the minor prophets. Another thing to keep in mind as, you read, as you're reading through Zephaniah, um, it seems like all these things are happening at once. He's going to speak of the Lord's return and also of uh, the destruction of Nineveh, the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah, the destruction of these heathen nations. And it sounds like it's all happening at one time. Um, good thing to remind ourselves about prophetic perspective. Uh, one of my SEM professors spoke of it as being like a painting. A painting is two dimensions. You can't tell how far away two objects are in a two-dimensional painting. Even as you look on the screen at my hands, you can't tell how far. You can tell there's a space between my two hands, but unless I turn it sideways, you can't really tell how far that space is. And so prophecy sometimes is two-dimensional. You have events happening, but you can't tell how much space there is between one event and another. So as we look back, we have more of a three-dimensional perspective. We know it was decades from the destruction of Nineveh in 612 to the destruction of Jerusalem in 592 or whatever that year was. So that's 20 years. But as Zephaniah talks about it, it sounds like it's happening one after the other. And especially when he talks about uh, the day of the Lord when he will destroy everything. That's the end of the world. So as we read these prophecies, they're stacked on top of each other and we can't tell uh, the order or the passage of time. But if you can keep in mind the prophetic perspective that from the prophet, he's viewing all these things, he's seeing this vision um, and all these things are happening. He just doesn't have any concept of passage of time. All right, any questions or thoughts on the introduction before we get into... Um, the book of Zephaniah. All right. The uh, outline I picked comes from uh, Kyle Dalich, which is an Old Testament commentary uh, that most of our pastors would be familiar with. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Kyle Dalich. Um, but anyway, he had a simple outline. Uh, section one covers chapter one, verse two through verse 18. Uh, simply put, judgment is coming. Uh, the second part would be chapter two, verse one through chapter three, verse eight, with a call to repentance. And part three uh, would be chapter 3, verse 9 through verse 20, and the promise of salvation to the remnant. So those that remain faithful to the Lord. 
So let's back up into section one. We're going to be taking a look at Zephaniah chapter one. Uh, this covers verses two through 18. The first brief section uh, I wanted to talk about is verses two through seven. Starting with verse two, um, Zeph the Lord says, I will sweep everything from the face of the earth. Verse three, I will sweep away both men and animals, sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Um, so as we hear the Lord threatening to destroy everything off the face of the earth in verse three, that reminds us especially uh, that how we need to be aware of the day of the Lord, uh, the day of Christ's return on judgment day. As the Lord talks about uh, the punishment and the judgment that's coming, I wanted to take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, Steve, I heard your microphone was working. Yeah, I just got to get situated here. So you okay. want 2 Peter 3? Yeah, I was going to ask if you could. I'm, my voice is a little weak from yelling at confirmation students. So if you could relieve me. Uh, All right. Verses 8 through 15. Yes, please. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. All right. So as Zephaniah writes about the day of the Lord, sweeping away the earth, uh, men and animals, birds and fish, cut off man from the face of the earth, um, also, let's see, moving on ahead in Zephaniah chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1, verse 15, the day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, darkness and gloom. Uh, 17 of Zephaniah will bring distress on the people. Um, in verse 18, in the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. Sounds a lot like what Peter says in uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 through 15. Uh, everything will be like here in verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works and all that are done on it will be exposed. Um, as we wait for the coming day of the Lord, that the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. Heavenly bodies will melt as they were burned. So again, what Zephaniah was warning the people about in his day, we find the Lord warning us about in our day, too. Another thing to keep in mind as we talk about um, the day of the Lord. So what should we do? Um, 2 Peter 3.14, as Steve read, if, since you're waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot and blemish and at peace. So, Knowing these days are coming, knowing um, what came on Judah and Jerusalem, 
in the Lord's judgment on them, the day of the Lord as he visited Judah and Jerusalem, we should keep that in mind too, as the Lord speaks that he's going to bring judgment on the whole earth. Looking at verses 11 and 12 of Zephaniah chapter 1. Um, let's see, Barb, could I have you read those? Chapter 1 of Zephaniah, verses 11 and 12. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All those who handle money are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. What I really wanted to draw your attention to in that verse was the second half of verse 12. Um, and he talks about the day of the Lord. Abigail, can you take care of Maggie? Thank you. My hunting dog is terrified of rain. So if there are <laughs> sprinkles of rain outside, she cannot stand it. Um, so the uh, people of Jerusalem, the Lord says, uh, they are complacent. They say in their heart, the Lord will, do, will not do good, nor will he do ill. Um, so what the Lord's going to do doesn't really matter. It's, he's going to do what he's going to do. It, it's no big deal. So they're complacent. So reading that reminded me of, uh, Revelation, uh, the letter to the church in Laodicea. And I wanted to take a look at that quick. I'll pull it up on your screen here in just a minute. Um, share it with you. See. So those at home can see. So to the church in Laodicea, so remember the Lord Jesus is speaking to the various churches, um, most of them in Asia Minor, uh, churches like in Ephesus uh, and so on. And he says to the church in Laodicea, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. So in other words, we say the church in Laodicea is lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, and poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see you know, we find here, as he writes to the church in Laodicea, themes very similar to what Zephaniah had to say to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. You think you're rich? You're spiritually bankrupt. Uh, come to me and you'll get wealth, uh, the riches of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so it struck me to hear in chapter 1, verse 12, about the complacency of Jerusalem. Um, that they say the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Uh, similarities between Laodicea and similarities between um, what we wrestle with in our own lives, our lukewarmness, uh, that eh, God's going to do what he's going to do. What does it matter? So the judgment is coming. Um, any thoughts on chapter 1? Anybody else have anything in that chapter that struck them? Pastor? Yes, ma'am. This is Bonna. I had just the change of attitude from self-reliance to dependence on God. Yeah. Uh, was there something in that chapter that especially struck you? Well, just the fact that we need not to, for myself, and this relates to myself. I'm kind of a controlling person, as you might know. Uh, so the, instead of relying on myself, I need to be more dependent on God. Yeah, I, and you're not alone in that, Bonnie. Um, we're all control freaks. I mean, it goes back to the garden. You too can be like God, and that's, uh, our, that's what our sinful nature wants to be. It wants to be in control. Um, and then when things are out of our control, we get anxious. 
because we've lost control of it. Um, and so the Lord calls us to put, put it in his hands. I think that's how you said it. Um, to be yes, dependent, yes. dependent on him. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the judgment is coming. Uh, section two then gets us into a call to repentance. Um, what is the Lord's purpose in announcing this judgment? Could I get a reader uh, for chapter two, verses one to three? Uh, Amens. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice, who seek righteous, whose righteousness seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So when the Lord announces judgment, he just doesn't announce it for the sake of announcing it. Um, because he despises the people. Remember, the Lord desires not the death of the wicked, but that he should turn from his way and live. Um, and Timothy, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire. Same thing here in Zephaniah. So we see God has not changed from Ezekiel, where he doesn't want the death of the wicked, to Timothy, where he desires all men to be saved, to Zephaniah here in chapter 2. The reason he's announcing uh, this judgment um, is so that the people gather together and in verse 3, seek the Lord. Be humble of the land, you who do what he's commands. The believers seek righteousness and humility, and perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. And that takes us back to the name Zephaniah, right? We said Zephaniah means he whom the Lord hides or shelters. Um, and ultimately, that's what we want. We want to take refuge under the wings of the Lord. We want to be sheltered in the day of the Lord. Um, and that's what we find in chapter 2, verse 1. Um, seek the Lord. Do what he says, seek him in humility, and in him find shelter or refuge. In chapters 3, verses 1 and 2, uh, why is this judgment coming? I can get another reader. I'm going to read Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 7. Get another reader out there. Uh, verse 1, woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. Verse 2, she obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. So part of the charges against Jerusalem is she doesn't obey. She won't accept correction. She doesn't trust in God. She doesn't draw near to God. And then verse 7 I said to the city, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her dwelling would not be cut off, nor my, all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Uh, this is NIV I have in front of me. But what a phrase, eager to act corruptly. They were eager to do the wrong thing. Um, that was the case in Jerusalem. That brought the judgment on them. Um, those are the charges against them. And then in verses 3 and 4, who do these charges include? Uh, verse 3, her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. So that's the state, right? That's the government. Um, they are like predators 
who consume everything they can for themselves and leave nothing for anyone else. And then verse four, her prophets are arrogant. They are treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. So not only is the state corrupt, the church is corrupt as well. And all of this is bringing judgment uh, the day of the Lord, the day of his visitation. This is why Nebuchadnezzar defeats, Babel, or defeats Judah and Jerusalem. Um, this is why their people are taken away captive. Uh, because the people won't obey, uh, don't trust in God, don't draw near him. The government, who is supposed to be God's representatives on earth, carrying out his will, uh, weren't carrying, weren't obeying the Lord. And the prophets, who are supposed to be God's messengers, proclaiming God's word, uh, were arrogant and treacherous. So God's nation, which he had set up, was no longer his people, but had strayed from him. Any questions on the call to repentance before we get into my favorite section, section three? A lot of parallels between the times we're living in today. Um, warnings against us as well to watch out for these things, um, not in other people, but in ourselves. Um, from a corrupt church, a corrupt government, um, and a corrupt nation. So when we see all this, these things going on, um, we don't have to have doom and gloom all the time. The Lord has some awesome promises of salvation to the remnant, to the believer. Um, so we're going to move on into section three, which covers chapter three, verse nine, through the end of the book of Zephaniah. Uh, let's go back to Steve. Uh, I'm going to have you read verses nine and ten of chapter three in Zephaniah. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From the river, no, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Okay. ESV, I think, was what you were reading. Uh, and the That's verse right. nine talks of them of serving with one accord. NIV, if any of you have that in front of you, uh, that speaks of them calling on the name of the Lord and serving him shoulder to shoulder. And what a, what a picture that is. You know, I see, I think of shoulder to shoulder, and I think of uh, the communicants lined up at the rail, shoulder to shoulder, um, calling on the name of the Lord, receiving his body and blood. But hearing that, uh, Worshiping the Lord and with one accord, having their mouths purified, praising him together, uh, reminded me of Revelation uh, chapter 7. Pull it up here on your screen. Revelation 7. I'll share it here. One moment. There we go. Revelation 7. Uh, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we live in a time of great divisiveness, both politically and racially, what a beautiful verse this is. That is, the Apostle John looks at this scene in heaven. Um, he sees people from all over the world, from different languages, different tribes, different races, all have one thing in common. They are all worshiping the Lamb. They've all been, had their robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. And so as 
as Zephaniah talks about changing people's speech, pure speech, they're calling on the name of the Lord and serving him with one of accord from all over, verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, uh, the dispersed ones. Same thing John is seeing in heaven itself as believers from the world over are worshiping the Lamb shoulder to shoulder. Uh, next, we're going to move on to verses 14 and 15. Uh, Barb, if you're still there, have you read chapter 3 of Zephaniah, verses 14 and 15. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. All right. So, while the day of the Lord is a fearful thing, uh, at one point, I forget what verse it is, it talks about it being an awesome or terrible thing. Um, let's see if I can find that reference. Chapter 2, verse 11, the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of their lands. Another translation is fearful or terrible, terrible thing. So the day of the Lord for the unbeliever is horrific. It is terrible. It is fearful. But the day of the Lord for the daughter of Zion, that is the church, is a reason to rejoice. Um, verse 15, pure gospel. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. Uh, the king of Israel is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Uh, our salvation is sure because our God is with us and our Savior is Emmanuel, who is God with us. So we don't need to fear the enemy anymore because the Lord has already defeated him. When Christ died and rose again, uh, he announced victory. And the great enemy of death the great enemy of sin and the great enemy of Satan has been turned away. All right, on to verse 17, a great verse. Um, interested to see if any of you uh, came up with any answers to the three questions I posed. So this is section three, letter J. Uh, there's point one, two, and three. Um, the NIV I have in front of me, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. This is just great stuff. Uh, interested to see if anybody came up with an answer to how the Lord your God, point one, has shown that he is with you. it out there and see if anybody has I got a mosquito in here I'm not just shooing my face things up my face anybody have anything for how the Lord your God has shown that he is with you Uh, well, I, I just put a couple of things down just, you know, personally, I mean, you know, um, with good health um, to family and friends, um, you know, um, not destitute, <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at, you know, all of that as being, you know, gifts from him. Sure. So all of, all of our... Um, how do we say that in the first article? Clothing, shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, cattle, all those things that the Lord demonstrates to us that he's with us. Uh, Butch, I see you are unmuted. Did you have something? Well, I would, along the lines of what Barb just said, it's fairly easy when you look around and you can see all the good things 
that have happened in our lives all by the grace of God, um, you can go almost anywhere and you can look around and, and the famous statement really biblical is, but for the grace of God, there go I. Um, and it's not because of what we've done on our own, whether it's our family or family lives. Yes, there are bumps in the way all the time, but uh, it maybe comes with age. Uh, I'll have to confess, I have an advantage over all of you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you're 30 or 40, you maybe just, uh, life is moving pretty quickly. And it'd be easy to say, woe is me and gosh, I was, wish I would be like so-and-so, but uh, it, it's, it's amazing what we have in our lives. Um, even as tough as sometimes our own country is to us, you don't have to look far outside our borders to uh, say again, but by the grace of God, uh, we have this great country that he's given us. I, I'm sure it was similar during the time of the Romans, you know, um, and unless we squander it, we give it all away, the Lord is taking care of pretty much all of us. He's in our midst. Um, and of course, the principal way we know God is with us, he's in our midst, is Jesus, uh, the one mighty to save. Um, and use the cross to save us and the grave to save us from the grave. Um, point two, uh, mighty to save. Again, I guess I touched on that a little bit. Um, he overcame the greatest of foes, death itself, when he rose from it. And then that beautiful phrase, he has quieted you, quieted you with his love. Um, interested to see if anybody had any thoughts or takeaways with that phrase. He has quieted you with his love. Oh, Bana, you pop on and then you pop off. It's like you want to say something, but you don't know if you should. Or you keep bumping your microphone button. If you want to say something, just say it and we'll, I'll let you go. Otherwise, uh, okay. Um, quieted you with his love. Should I ask my wife what? That makes her think of. Um, well, I think of, especially right now, my uh, time of life right now. Um, whenever I'm pregnant, there's always there's just a lot more. You think about the things that can go wrong, and there's a lot more that feels potentially out of your control. Which you know we talked about that already. That we're not in control. God is in control, and. Um, there's been a lot of moments just really realizing that, that God is really in control and reading those passages that talk about um, how God works all things for our good and um, just, you know, really trusting him. Um, and I have to, of course, go back to those passages again and again. Um, but that just really gives a quieting feeling. And God can take care of all of that anxiety, no matter what it is that you're anxious about or worried about. Uh, Barb. Could it kind of be read as also like calmed you with this love? Kind of the same Yeah, I, term I, I think of it like a mother uh, with her baby. That the baby's fussy, the baby doesn't want dad, the baby doesn't want anybody else, but mom comes along 
and kind of quiets the baby uh, with her love, just assuring the baby that mom is here, you'll be okay. Um, and that's what the Lord does with his love. He, he comes and he quiets us, he calms us. Jesus saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always. Um, I'll give you rest for your souls. Uh, you know, like he would be with his disciples that, you know, the disciples, how many times should have they known better that Jesus was going to take care of them? I mean, sleeping in a boat in the middle of a storm, and they think they're going to drown with Jesus sleeping in the boat with them. Um, so Jesus comes and he quiets us with his love, uh, calms us in our fearful moments. But again, we need those passages of love, passages like this, that we need to go back to and draw on so we can be calmed and quieted. Any other thoughts on verse 17? Just a really great verse. We're gonna to touch on it more in a little bit here. Yeah, um, I just have, an, I guess I have another example of quieted you with his love. Uh, it was a few years ago and I was waiting for the train downtown at my stop and it was a little later than usual and I was a little anxious about it. There were a lot of people around, you know, nothing suspicious or anything, but just a lot of people around and, you know, it was late. Um, and I, I don't remember if it was because of a recent Bible study or what, but I just had this thought about how much, how each of the people that were on that platform with me, how much God loved them and how much God loved me. And that just really took away my anxiety and just calmed me down. Like the situation is the same, but, um, you know, God is here with his love for everyone and is taking care of all these people in the same way he's taking care of me. And for some reason that just was very calming. Mm. Good. The lesson, Sarah, is to not take the train so late. Oh, but uh, I mean, that's again, the value of knowing the gospel promises, knowing your God, knowing who he is and what he's done and what he wants for all people is that when you know his love, it, it comes and it calms us, it quiets us um, in our fearful moments. And when the day of the Lord comes and you see everything that the Bible says leading up to the day of the Lord, I mean, we talked about it on Sunday in church as well. Uh, those are going to be some fearful things, but the Lord comes and he quiets us with his love saying, I'm going to shelter you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to see you through this. Um, uh, Butch. The other reassuring thing is that if the good Lord calls us home by whatever means, on a railroad uh, platform or driving a car or whatever the, the cause would be, it's comforting to know that wherever we go with him, it's going to be so much better than we got it right now anyway. I mean, we, we can't lose. Um, yeah, people around us, uh, who knows, they, I was kind of uh, related to some situations that I've had in my family and, and people have passed. And then I got to remember a lot of the grieving. I'm happy for them. But when I start feeling sorry for myself and all the things they did for me while they were here, um, you start to realize, I, in my case, realized I was probably just feeling sorry for myself rather than feeling as, as triumphant as I should have and did in many cases, but triumphant for them. They're much better off than this veil of tears here. So it's helped me just to think about, yeah, you're doing some things that seem neat here, but uh, when the good Lord calls you home, it's just unbelievable how good it's gonna be. I might quote you on Sunday, which uh, text for Sunday is Romans 14 and includes that verse. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Um, again, that's another quieting us with his love, that whether we're living or we're in the process of dying, 
here comes the Lord with his love um, to calm us and quiet us. All right, on to verse 20. Thank you for your contributions, everybody. Um, verse 20. Um, while the day of the Lord would be a fearful thing for those who do not trust in the Lord, what does the Lord promise to do for his believing people? Uh, chapter 3, verse 20. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. Um, the Lord's addressing the return from the Babylonian captivity. But as we think about the day of the Lord on Judgment Day, uh, when God will destroy everything and make a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, when Jesus comes and says, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Um, what a great thing. But that's, that's waiting for us. Um, we talked about on Sunday, we know the end of the story. Now, right now, we're just uh, waiting to see how the chapters in between unfold as we keep our eyes on the Lord. Taking a look at verses 9 through 20, then, I had uh, your assignment was to write five things the Lord says to his people in these verses that you want to take with you. Um, so I'm going to open it up, uh, verses 9 to 20. Uh, just if any of you had one thing, um, I think that's horrible grammar. If any of you had one thing, that sounds just bad. Um, one takeaway from those verses that you could share uh, from verses 9 to 20. Uh, start with Barb. The Lord your God is in your midst. Yeah, uh, certainly when everything seems to be falling apart around us and near us, that's a, it's a good one to hang on to, that uh, God is in our midst. Anybody else have one takeaway they wanted to hang on to from those verses? Um, not a specific thing, but the the fact that um, God does all the work. He's the one who's purifying. He's the one who's rescuing and giving and, um, you know, all the important things God does. And what do we do? We sing. Uh, we praise him. Uh, God's doing all this, and we're just going to shout about it. Um, very good. Thank you. Uh, Bana. I had safety, no fear. You know, basically our troubles will be over. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Evan, I see you were unmuted. Did you have one? Uh, yeah. I, I really liked how it's just not, it's just not like, it, it doesn't just say the Lord is with you, which is a comfort in itself. It, it reminds you that the mighty warrior really reminds you of the power of God and knowing you, you don't just have, you know, somebody watching over you who doesn't really care. It's like, the, got, the, you know. We got somebody bigger than Goliath on our side in our midst, right among us. Uh, Butch. In verse 15, where it says, the Lord hath taken away thy judgments and hath cast out thine enemy. Those are uh, rather important. Yeah. Anybody else have... Uh, one thing they took away, uh, Barb. Um, I had another one um, that um, we shall not be ashamed for any of our deeds. I don't remember which verse that was in, but I remember reading that in that range of verses anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. On that day, you should not be, yeah, 11. 
you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. So our sin, uh, tying together with the butch said, the judgments are all taken away. Um, Great, uh, yep. It kind of reminds me of Isaiah uh, when the Lord talks about um, uh, uh, comfort, comfort ye my people. Um, you've received double from the Lord's hand. So uh, we just didn't receive one good thing, but grace upon grace, that concept that uh, you're not going to be ashamed of your deeds. Um, Let's see, radicals, it looks like you're unmuted. Did you have one? Yep. He will quiet you by his love. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we personally, we've been going through so many things that quiet is what we need. <laughs> Amen. Um, let's see, Vana, did you have another one? Humility and humbleness, which was basically what she just said, quiet us with his love. Same thing. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that stuck out in 16 uh, for me, um, 16, fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. You know, sometimes it feels like it's a fruitless labor that you're just trying whatever it is you're laboring in the Lord on whether it's praying for somebody, uh, wrestling with a family matter, whatever it is, it just feels like, ugh, and just give it up and quit it. Um, but tying together again with Evan, don't let your hands grow weak because the Lord your God is in your midst. Uh, that mighty one who will save the warrior uh, concept, uh, the one rejoicing over you. So whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord with all your might. Don't let your hands grow weak and as you labor for him. Great. Any others? And again, uh, nine to twenty, none of this is possible without Christ. You take Jesus out of the out of the picture, and uh, the judgments are not taken away. The judgments can only be taken away because Christ took the judgment on himself was punished in our place um, only because he's mighty to save are we rescued only because of his love are we quieted you take christ out of the equation and we have every reason to fear the day of the lord and to fear his judgments um, but because uh, christ already bore that for us now the lord is our refuge um, and now, as one voice purified by the Lord, uh, we serve him with one accord and call upon his name. We worship him with all believers in Christ and in the invisible Holy Christian Church. Uh, invisible now, visible in heaven. So, great stuff. So I hope you enjoyed Zephaniah as much as I did. I really enjoyed the review of this book. Um, some really good nuggets in there. Any other questions or thoughts on Zephaniah? All right, next Wednesday, we plan to take a look at the book of Haggai. Again, I had a professor who would mispronounce this one as well and called it Haggai. I'm not sure why or how, but um, out of respect for my professor, we just let it roll. But Haggai uh, is the plan for next Wednesday. And then in two weeks on the 7th, I have pastoral conference and sleepy eyes. So I will be, uh, we will not be having Bible class in two weeks on the 7th, but we will next Wednesday, the 30th. That one you might get in in 45 minutes. I see it's only one chapter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a short one, oh, two, two chapters. Oh, is it two? Okay. Yeah. We'll see. Um, you know, I find a way to fill an hour if you give me the time. Pastor, uh, I know it's looking out a little bit. Just try not to uh, double schedule things. On the 18th of November, uh, oh, we... Butch. Oh, <laughs> November. Uh, 2020, not 2021. <laughs> no, okay, okay. 
I'll make it a little easier for you. Uh, Bible class, will are we going to have those in November? Or are you that far out on scheduling? Or uh, assume we have. I'm assuming we will. Elders are going to talk about it tomorrow, kind of look at our game plan moving forward as a congregation, looking at uh, indoor services, moving from outdoor to indoor. Although Pastor Dave Schoenbeck said he's willing to have it outside until it's about 20 below. Is that what he said? He might have said 55, 55 above. Maybe that's what he said. Yeah, he said a lot of things over the years. He did. Um, but he really likes these outdoor services. I think this is his uh, one thing he really likes. Anyway, so we'll be well, talking about it. Him anyway, which makes it good. Thanks for doing that. Oh, we, I enjoy it. Uh, so we'll be look, talking tomorrow night about a game plan moving forward. I imagine we're going to be doing Wednesday night Bible class for quite a while here, um, at least till Thanksgiving. So I think the 18th would be a week out from Thanksgiving or so? It's, it's the Wednesday, two Wednesdays prior to, yeah. Okay. So I would imagine we'd still be having it. Um, and then we'll, once we get into Advent, you know, that'll impact whether, how we have Bible class from there on out. Pastor? Which would you? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was wondering if, when it did get too cold to have outdoor services, whether we might consider having a nine and an 11 o'clock service or maybe a Saturday night service? That's a possibility. I think, yeah, that's, that's on the um, discussion. So the nine and 11 maintaining that or looking at a Saturday night high risk service and then um, a 9 a.m. dirty children service. <laughs> that sound bad? <laughs> The only I, issue with Saturday night is, and, and some people like Saturday night, but it is dark yeah, and it is, yeah, it's cold, where the 11 o'clock might give us a little bit, at least, well, my preference is 11 o'clock, but my sister's preference is Saturday, so you have I to- know, I know that one. <laughs> You'll have to deal with us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll have you two duke it out and let me know who she wins. She usually wins, so I'll give you <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's part of the discussion. I don't know that there's a good, good answer, but we'll we'll just have to see what we think is best and go with it. Um, but yeah, I I imagine for the time being, until they lift um, gathering sizes and things like that, we can't really fit more than 80 in the sanctuary uh, and space them out. So 70 is a good number. 80 starts to get would start to get pretty tight. So we'd be looking at two services um, moving forward. So, you know, maybe the Lord will give us a beautiful October um, and we'll have, you know, continue and enjoy warm weather until November. And then, and then we'll be done with COVID at, in November. So it'll be great. Well, we deserve a mild winter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining us, and uh, Lord's blessings on your week. May the Lord continue to quiet you with his love, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Okay.